Hey all y'all, I'm Bart Massey uh, here with another rest related video. I wanted to talk to you today about uh, some of the demos, a couple of the demos from the book Programming Rust, the O'Reilly book by Jim Blandy and Jason Orendorf, which is a fantastic book. And I wanted to walk through a couple of those demos. Uh, I've messed with the code a little bit to make them easier to talk about and show you what they look like and give you a feeling for basic project structure and how things work in Rust. So let's take a look at these. Along the way, we'll see some cool functionality. So here we go. So I've cloned a copy of the Iron GCD demo. You could do the same by going to this um, to get my copy. Um, PDX CS Rust, Programming Rust, Iron GCD. That's a mouthful, but it should be everything that you need to uh, follow along here if you want to play that game. So feel free to pause right now. I just want to look at the overall project structure, talk a little bit about what's going on. Um, when you clone it, you will not get this target directory here. That won't actually be part of the clone um, that's what we get from building I've went ahead and built this because it takes a few seconds and I didn't want everybody to have to wait but and you may also not get the cargo dot lock I don't remember if that's the case um, yeah the cargo dot lock is part of the thing right it has to be so the first thing I should say about this demo is that it is written with an older edition of rust because the book, while it's about to be updated this year, is a couple of years old. That shouldn't matter much. Most of what we're gonna look at today is pretty much standard Rust, and I've done some work, modern Rust, and I've done some work to actually clean it up a little bit so that it looks a little fresher. Uh, having said that, I'll try to point out things along the way that we might do differently in the modern world, but I think it's pretty close. So maybe the best way to start is to demo it. Um, let's just go ahead and show its functionality. If I say cargo run, I will get serving on localhost blah. So let's go over to a browser here. And what I've got is a web service that's running locally on my machine. And when I go to the URL, where the web service is waiting. Here I have this GCD calculator. And the idea of the GCD calculator is if I wanna find the greatest common divisor, that's the GCD of two numbers, I can say something like, well, what's the greatest common divisor of 12 and eight? I can hit the compute GCD button and I get a wonderfully formatted page that says, well, the GCD of 12 and eight is four, which actually is the right answer. So that's what we've what we, and by we I mean uh, Jim Blandy and Jason Orendorf, have built. You can take a look at their excellent book for their discussion of this demo, which is much more extensive than what I'm going to do today, but that's the idea here. So I'm going to set this back aside, stop my service, and we're going to look a little bit at what we got. So first of all, what are all these files here? We've got a cargo.toml. And that file contains information that Cargo, the Rust build tool, needs to know how to build and link your thing. So we see a copyright notice uh, that's just a comment with hashtags. We see that the package is named Iron GCD. So if I actually look in target slash debug slash Iron GCD, um, I'll find the executable. Uh, that size is dramatic. Most of that is not interesting. It's debug symbols. But yeah, Rust binaries are statically linked, so they tend to be large. So that name is what determines what you're gonna do there. We have a version number, which is set to 0.1.0. I should probably bump the version at some point to indicate my changes, but I haven't. That uses something called semantic versioning. You can look that up on the web. And we have addition equals 2018. That's an addition that says 
compile using the modern Rust stuff. Most Rust is 2018 these days, but you have to put this in here for Cargo and the compiler to treat it as a 2018 program. Otherwise, it will use Rust 2015 edition by default, which is a little older and has different stuff. The last section here uh, is this dependency section. And that lists crates libraries on a place called crates.io that provide the functionality that does most of the work of the web service part of this application. So Iron is an old web framework which has been revived recently. It's a perfectly usable Rust web framework for simple things. It doesn't have many fancy features, but it has the fancy feature of working. You'll notice that we've specified an older version. The current version is 0.6 point something, but this code works with the older version, so I haven't explored upgrading it. Um, the MIME crate is used for the multimedia internet messaging extensions. That's the stuff that takes care of what kind of content am I serving over this uh, web service. The router is a plugin to Iron that says, well, based on the URL, what should I call? And then the URL encoded crate takes care of the fact that typically these requests are made in an encoded form as text and this can decode that form. So that's that. What's What else is in here? There's a cargo.lock, which if you look inside is kind of a messy blob. As it says, it's automatically generated by cargo when you build something. It keeps track of a bunch of the information of what you've got and where it came from. So for every crate, Every library that was in, used to build this, directly or indirectly, this includes all the indirect dependencies, of which you can see there's quite a lot. It keeps track of what version it is. It keeps track of where it got it from. And so what that means is that when you've got a cargo.lock, you on your machine can build with exactly the same artifacts that I on my machine built on. So that's kind of nice. There's checksums to make sure that everything really is what it's supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the cargo.lock. For binary crates, it's often a good idea to commit the cargo.lock to your Git. We're using Git here. Uh, cargo, when you initialize something, actually makes a Git repo for you by default. And so uh, Git is sort of privileged in that sense in cargo. The Conventional wisdom is that for binary crates like this, you really want to, people to be able to reproduce exactly your build. And so checking the cargo.lock into the Git repo as we've done here is probably a good idea, even though it's a machine generated build artifact. So we also have a license file. We also have a readme.md. And the readme.md just describes what's going on. Uh, this is MIT licensed. We have, like I say, this target directory, which we got by saying cargo build. Let's say it again. Right now it does it very fast because it's already built. But if we were to make changes to the source file, um, it will only rebuild the actual program itself because all the libraries are built. Cargo builds libraries from their source code and so the rather than downloading binaries of libraries and so the first build of a thing can be really slow this will take 10 or 15 seconds if I clean it up and build it but you'll notice that on subsequent builds it does the make thing it only actually builds the things that have changed. And so the for this thing that you can see the subsequent build was two seconds, which is perfectly usable. Um, so let's look at the source code to this fine web service. Uh, first are these use declarations. These are manipulating the namespace. They say, yeah, we have all these libraries, like the Iron library, the MIME library, the router library, the standard library, and the URL encoded library. We saw those four of those five in the dependencies. And this says, you bring some names 
from those libraries into scopes so that you can use them undecorated. Without this, you'd have to stick those prefixes that are shown right here onto uh, every use of the identifiers. This iron prelude is sort of special. It says bring in all the functions that are, and all the symbols that are intended to be brought in by default in iron. So this gives the crate uh, library crate author, the iron author, the chance to sort of suggest, yeah, these are probably all things you want, but it looks like we have, we need one thing that wasn't brought in by the prelude. The star here means bring in all symbols in that module. So in this case, I'm bringing in everything in the mime crate. I'm not thinking about what I want there. The other ones are very specific about what names they want to bring in. Router from the router crate, from stir from stood, and uh, URL encoded body from URL encoded. You'll notice that I have dot comments on this. Now, that's kind of unusual to do actually for a binary crate because for an executable program source code, because by default, cargo doesn't doc doesn't do anything very useful with it. It turns out there's a flag you can use to actually document this code. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, dash, there's two things going on here. Dash dash open provide makes it open the documentation in the web browser when it's done building it. Dot dash dash document private items makes cargo actually use that Rust doc style documentation that's sitting in that file, even for things that aren't published, you know, don't have a pub declaration like they would in a library crate. So this means don't just document the interface because for a binary, the interface isn't all that interesting, document everything. So let's look at what that looks like. I have a window lying around here somewhere. Let's just use this one again. And we will run this command and it will document things. And look, we get this very, very beautiful documentation and we can click around in it. You, you see what the functions do. I, I, get, I can get better documentation of what these look like. Uh, if I wanna know something about the types they use, then I can click on those as well. So this is exactly the same as the documentation, the Rust doc documentation for everything else. And this is all local on our machine. We're not hitting the web for this. So that's really super convenient. For this toy example, it's probably overkill, but sometimes it's really quite nice. So you'll notice we get this funny thing because Cargo actually compiled two different pieces of our program with two different versions of the numtrace crate. And again, up here, two different versions of the log crate. So in the documentation, it doesn't know which one to link to. And that's a bug apparently that's being worked on. That's cool. But mostly you don't have to worry about it. It doesn't hurt anything. So the last piece, the piece we really care about is this source slash main.rs. Let's take a look at that. So like we were saying before, here's a bunch of things. This actually takes, generates a response, which is an iron thing. It's the type of an HTTP response. It makes a new response. It sets its status with the set mute thing to be whatever error code, whatever status uh, it was passed. And then it sets the message that it's the text that will be returned with that response to the message. And then it returns it. Notice that in Rust, we don't say return. We just put the value at the end and it gets returned. So that's used here. If a request has failed, we say status bad request, and we take whatever message we were passed and we make a result. What's a result? Well, a result is this thing wrapped in OK. A result can be either OK or error. Iron result is a special thing where the type of the error is an iron error, and so you don't actually have to specify it. Again, with the OK, here's where we use the mime crate. We're going to make text HTML and charset UTF-8 in the response so that when that GCD is for text is passed back, it's actually clear. 
And again, we just return an OK of that. So let's look at the interesting bit. This is where we actually handle a POST request. So what's a POST request? If you know a little HTML, HTTP, web service stuff, when the you fill out a form in the browser, which is what we did with our numbers, and ask to have that form processed, the browser will send a POST request over HTTP to the web service. And the web service will then get that with the form data in it. And so, and it will eventually return a response. Here's what I want you to do now, client, you know, browser, here's what I want you to do now that I've processed this. So we start by digging the form data out of the client. And you'll notice that we can return an error here. We can return, ah, oh, there was an error parsing the form data, and that would be the end of it. And that's if there is no form or something like that. Otherwise, we unwrap this data from the OK we got back from the request.getref, and we just, that's our data. Now, we need to dig the N field out of the form data. N is the thing, if you actually look at our form down here, um, name equals N is a number. It's the thing we're supposed to compute the GCD of. So we're matching on that name and we're going to, again, check to see if there's any numbers in the form data. And finally, Sure, the end field has form data in it, but if the user types some kind of garbage, it may not be readable as a number. And so in that case, again, we return a response bad that says, well, this was a bad number. Otherwise, we actually calculate the GCD. If, And uh, that's the end of that. So notice if it fails, we'll return a failure response if it didn't manage to deal with the numbers. And otherwise it will return a uh, okay response, which contains our text in it, formatted with the format command to be a string. And notice this unwrap here. That's because you can sort of prove that result is is some because if it was is none this would have happened up here honestly this isn't great i think i'm going to change this code to be cleaner i didn't notice this till right now uh none is this thing so there's sort of more and less rustic ways to do things. The more rustic way here would be to actually use pattern matching to, uh, to deal with it. And And that way, you know, the compiler, you don't have to do any clever reasoning about what's going on. You're quite confident that one of two things will happen with this result. Either it was none, which we set up here when um, we had no data, and then we'll do this guaranteed. Otherwise, it's some answer, which is some string, some number, sorry. And uh, the answer then is formatted and the response is returned. I think that's going to be better. Well, I feel better about that. Um, we'll just put respond here, which isn't a complete sentence, but oh well, well there we are. So here's the form. So this is the response to a GET request. And again, if you know your HTTP, when you visit a URL, when you type some URL in the browser and hit return, then the web server gets a message that contains that whole URL, including the part we call the path with the slashes in it. And there's some particular path here that's put up that form for the GCD calculation. 
And this is the function that answers that request, that get request. And it, you'll notice that it's got underbar request here. The underbar means ignore what the request is. As all you care about is that a request came to this particular path. It had this particular URL. You don't really care what kind of thing it was other than a get request to that URL. And now you're going to generate a response. And the response is going to be to give back the form. And we do that by just taking this raw Rust string. This is a raw string. The R pound here, quote here, has to match the quote pound here. And everything inside is treated as a string and is and we do that because we have all these double quotes in here. We don't want to deal with them. We use to string to change it from a static stir to an own string. And then we return that string as the OK response to our query. Here's the actual guts of the GCD calculator. It's boring. You can go look on Wikipedia if you want for the um, Euclidean GCD algorithm. And it's this. And here's some tests. So this is a classic Rust thing that you want to do. You put a unit test in here just to make sure that things work. Uh, you'll notice that this, how this test works. First of all, it says, well, 14 and 15 don't have any common divisors. 14 is 2 times 7 and 15 is 3 times 5. And so the GCD should be 1. So I'm going to make sure that's true. And then I'm going to carefully construct something that has some common divisors, right? I'm using these primes for n1, these primes for n2, multiplying them all together. And the common divisor should be 3 times 11, because those are the only two numbers that are in common in this. And so we're going to check that that works. And it's probably overkill to unit test this, because the GCD is not, you know, it's a well-known algorithm implemented straight from pseudocode. But things can happen. It's probably better to have a test. Now, here's the main program. Here's where we actually do this thing. So the router is set up. We get a router, and this is that router from that router crate that we looked at earlier that's going to help Iron figure out what to do with different URLs. And so if the URL is just slash, it's the root URL, meaning that you didn't type anything. You just typed the address of this thing, localhost colon 3000, into the browser. Then you get the get form URL, which returns the form, puts it up on your browser. Now, when you finally hit compute GCD, then the form actually is hard coded, if you look up above, to send to the slash GCD path, localhost colon 3000 slash GCD. And so that will handle. Um, that form data that's posted there. And all that's left, once you've set up the router, is to create a new server with that router, let it know that its URL it's supposed to live on is localhost colon 3000. And then this dot expect will panic the program if the server couldn't start, which isn't great, but what else really can you do? The let underbar here means ignore any information returned from the thing and we're up and running. I don't remember what Iron D returns exactly. So that's the Iron GCD web server. You'll notice that it's 139 lines of code for a fairly simple function. It's not too bad really for something written in a low level language and it's got a couple routes and it's going to be pretty reliable because the compiler says so. And let's do some things we should probably do now that we've made a change to it. Cargo check. See if it compiles. It does. Check is the fast way to compile a thing. But of course, now I'm going to run, first of all, then I'm going to call cargo format to make sure that everything's still well formatted. I'm going to call cargo clippy. Clippy says, yeah, this looks fine to me. Cargo build. And now it's going to recompile our program. And then we'll go cargo run. And our server's up again. So let's reload over here. 
Notice that it did make it to this, it's tiny, you may not be able to see it, but it did make it to the slash GCD route. I'll go back to localhost colon 3000, make sure everything still works. Uh, let's do something that doesn't work. That's, that's not going to work. Oh, look, bad number, n equals hello. That's not a great error message, but it'll work. Let's try uh, 12 and 8 again. Now, what happens if we try 0? The GCD algorithm is not well-defined, typically, if we try to compute the GCD of 0. And I'm going to guess, oh, it panicked with an assertion failure. So this is the kind of thing you got to watch out for. Just because it's Rust doesn't mean your stuff can never crash. But you'll notice that it panicked with a really nice assertion here. So I can at least figure out what's going on. So let's look at that. First of all, Uh, there we go. Always remember to commit. What was it? Line 103. Oh, yeah. So I'm passing zeros here. Uh, and then this assertion failed. So I'm calling GCD in violation of its contract. So let's go find out where we call it. There we are. So what we want is for each of these numbers, so in the first case we have nothing, and then later we get some D, and then we get, right, some GCD of R and D. So. Okay, right, so this result thing is being used sort of in a funny way here. All right, but what we need to do is uh, if either of these numbers is, let's see, these are U64, so we only have to worry about case like this. Uh, Cannot take GCD of zero and uh, I think I probably have to convert it to a string. We shall never know. I'm just gonna do it. So that should take care of the case where we where the user supplied zero to us, which is great because we really aren't supposed to be able to do that. So now instead of a panic, uh, we should have our actual GCD. So I think that's actually okay. So let's see how this goes. Let's build it. I'm gonna do it from inside because why not? And by the way, we never did run cargo tests. We probably should. Oh yeah, the GCD test passed. That's the only test we have. So let's cargo run again. Let's go back to where we tried to talk to this thing. Let's try hello world and see what it does now. Excellent. But now let's go back and do zero, zero again. Hey, look at that. There we go. So now we've fixed another bug. Fixed handling of zero in GCD. Get format. Did I format? Get format. Cargo format. And let's see. Okay, yeah, I was afraid of that. All right, so git commit my a amend there. Oops, darn it. And uh, git, and let's get rid of these old dead ones and git push. 
So now we have a couple of nice changes. Cargo Clippy. Yeah, it's fine. Get push. See, the nice thing about Rust for this is that you have a lot of rails. Cargo Format and Cargo Clippy help keep your code neat. Cargo Test helps you ensure that you haven't broken something. If you've got adequate testing, you can check whether things have broken since you used it last. So really, this is all about Sorry, I don't know how to work the thing. Really, this is all about getting set up with a good situation, sort of following standard conventions, and you're all good to go. And we've got a cool little web app. So let's go look at the other example. I think this one we're done with. Let me go back to looking at code. The other example here is even cooler, and I'm not going to demo it until the end because it's so cool I don't want to give away the surprise. What I've got here is the so-called Mandelbrot set demo. Again, this is from the O'Reilly book Programming Rust by Blandy and Orendorf. I'm going to go through this one faster because most of this we've already talked about, but uh, Here's my cargo.lock, my cargo.toml, which is absolutely vanilla here, just like the other one was. It depends on different crates this time, num, image, and crossbeam. Crossbeam is a parallelism crate, we'll see it in a bit. Image deals with reading and writing image files. And num is generic numerics, because we're going to have complex numbers in this thing. So if you look at Again, I've built this already. Let's take a look at this and see what we got. So the Mandelbrot set is defined by a fancy fractal. And you really should see the textbook, which discusses a little bit about what the Mandelbrot set is. The important thing to understand about it is what we're going to do is for each pixel in an image, we're going to compute a value for that pixel by iterating a function over complex numbers. So, and the complex number there is going to be sort of the x, y position. The x position will be the real part. The y position will be the imaginary part of this complex number. So this is sort of the key routine, escape time. It, it takes some complex number representing a position on the screen. It takes a limit on how many tries it does to do something called escaping. The details don't matter. And it returns an option type. Now, option types are funny. This means that either there's some escape in the amount of time given by this U64, or there's none, meaning it, it never did escape in the time given by the limit. So if this thing returns sum, the thing inside the sum can never be bigger than limit. So we just do a little loop, and any time that this repeated complex squaring operation, notice that we're squaring over complex numbers here. We make a complex number at the beginning, and we what we do is this is the sort of accumulator and so what we do is we square it and add the number we were passed in and we keep doing that until either our accumulator gets above four in which case we're done it's escaped or until it doesn't get above four in all this for loop in which case we return none meaning we didn't escape so that's the sort of thing that defines a pixel is that escape time the rest of it is all dealing with stuff. This parse pair, which is talked about a little in the book, has to do with, well, I, I want to parse a complex number, or I want to parse a pair of coordinates, or something like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I have a string that represents two numbers, and or two other kinds of values. And they're separated by some character that's a separator character. I'm going to take my input string, split it at the separator character, and then collect it up into a vector of fields. So it could be two or more. 
but uh, then I immediately check and say, well, if it isn't exactly two, then it wasn't a pair, so I'm just going to return none. Again, I'm using option to indicate whether it successfully parsed a pair or not. Otherwise, I'm going to do this thing where I match on a tuple containing the fromster to t of the thing. So we're actually going to call t colon colon fromster. What's t? Well, t is some type that implements fromster. I don't know what it is, right? It could be almost anything. And in fact, we'll call it with the complex numbers at one place, t being complex at one case, t being integer at another place or a float, and it'll all be good. And if both the fromsters returned okay, then we're good. Otherwise, no, nah, it wasn't so good. And that underbar there is the pattern that matches anything. So unless I got a tuple of okays, I am not happy. And that's the end of that. Here's how we parse a complex number. We use parse pair. We take the real part and the imaginary part. We assume they're separated by a comma. And if parse pair returns some pair of floats, then notice that it's a complex F64. If parse pair returns a pair of floats, then we return the complex number with that floating real and imaginary part. And otherwise we return none. Now this is kind of ugly. There are cleaner ways to write this, but this was this is easier to understand maybe, even though it's a little more code. So we'll leave it as it is instead of fixing it up like we did in the last one. And it's interesting here that inside the function body, there's absolutely no type declarations, right? How does it know, how does parse pair know that it's supposed to return a pair of floating point numbers? Well, because in this case, if it returns a, a pair of some type, that type has to be translatable to a complex. Well, what kind of complex? A complex with F64 components. So the type inference engine is pretty clever, does clever things. This is an abstraction I added. I don't think you'll, I don't remember if you'll find this in the textbook. I don't remember what we did. But the, this says, well, here's, here's a pixel space, which is sort of notionally a struct that represents the width and height of your image that you're going to generate, and then sort of maps that to the upper left and right hand corners of the complex space of the space represented as complex numbers. So this tells you what the mapping is from pixel coordinates to complex numbers that you're going to call escape thing with. And so, uh, and uh, so now I'm going to actually use that pixel space. It'll, I'll give it a pixel to point routine, which says, well, here's a pixel coordinate. I want you to return a complex number. I'm going to check to make sure that the number is in the rectangle or sorry is yeah is not too far to the right we're not going to render points off the right hand edge and since these are unsized i can't render off the left hand edge so once i've validated these coordinates and sprinkling assertions throughout your rest code is a really really good idea because it helps you detect cases where things were used wrong we saw that earlier with gcd so this is Notice this dot zero dot one notation. Pixel is a tuple. Dot zero picks off the first element of the tuple. Dot one picks off the second element of the tuple. And so I'm going to go ahead and just do the obvious scaling thing where for some value of obvious where I figure out how far along the picture the thing is. And I use the complex corners and scale accordingly. I do what's called bilinear interp interpolation and then I'll return that complex. So that's cool. He, and when I say I throughout this code, I mean Blandy and Orendorf to some extent. Most of this wasn't mine. So now we're going to go ahead and write code that renders some section. Notice that the section is passed in as a mutable slice of U8s. That's a strange type. So how does this work? What does it even do? Well, notice that this is a method of pixel space. So it actually has can call pixel to, its pixel to point method because we're past self by reference. And so what we're going to do is pixel to point. We're going to call escape time and that gives us a time. And you'll notice that we chose the escape time carefully here. It's 255 steps. 
So if it lasts more than 255 steps with that complex number, then we get none, which we're gonna encode as black. So these are essentially color values. And then this is 255 minus T as U8. And so I'm gonna flip it around so that longer escapes are closer to black. Sh quicker escapes are closer to white. Uh, and I'm gonna represent that as U8s. And then I'm gonna just store into that slice. So my pixel value, I'm just gonna stuff in there. And where is P coming from here? Oh, I see. So I'm just gonna traverse this in row column order. And I'm gonna just use this index just like you would in C or anything else. There's again, cleaner ways to do this with functional programming, but this is fine and it's really easy to read and understand. So that's where we actually make it. But there's one more twist, one more little hook that we have to take care of, which is that we actually want to do parallelism. We'd actually like to use multiple processors to speed up this rendering process. And to do that, well, we're going to set up the pixels and we're going to take chunks of those pixels and render them separately. So here's where we actually spawn a new process that renders a band of pixels that we've picked out with this pixels chunk thing and played with. And all of this done is, is done using Crossbeam's construct called scoped threads. And so at the end of the day, you don't have to think very much about the parallelism. All you gotta do is call spawn with one of these fancy move closures. And you know, however many threads you have, it'll break the image up into that many bands and render each band, horizontal band as its own thing. Horizontal or vertical? Uh, width times dh, no, vertical. So, so the bands go across and there's a bunch of them stacked up. And then at the end, writing out our image, once we've got it actually rendered, is as easy as calling the, making a new PNG encoder and the portable network graphics format encoder and encoding the thing and then calling that encoder. Notice that we're gonna use an eight bit grayscale encoding. And so that's why we chose zero to 255 up above. Here's how we get bands. We actually pass in some indication of what the start and end of the band are. And then we make a whole new pixel space from ourself that's the pixel space for that band. Again, tests. This tests whether pixel to point returns what I expect it to. So I set up a real simple pixel space and make sure that pixel to point works. Should probably test some of that other stuff too, but I don't right now. Here's a function that gives a usage message. And that usage message is nice because it gives us a clue how to run this thing. And then it exits with status one. This exclamation point here means this function will never return. It will always exit the program rather than returning. So that's what this means. So first we take all the command line arguments that are passed to our Mandelbrot thing and take them apart. I'm not gonna go through this code in detail. The one thing I will say, like I said in this comment up here, is that we should probably pull one of the many rust crates for parsing arguments and try to use that instead for a lot of this rather than doing it all custom like we have. Then we set up the space for our image and we just go for it. Notice that this will panic if, if right image fails. That's not great, but hey, it's a toy demo. So that's the Mandelbrot code. Let's see what it looks like when we actually run it. And this is taken right out of the readme. So I'm gonna type this out. What does this mean? It means generate a, into a file called mandelbrot.png, a 1000 by 1000 image with the complex number 0 0.2, 0 0.5 at the upper left-hand corner and 0 0.4, 0 0.7 
as the lower right corner and use three threads. If I don't use three threads, it'll take longer. Let's see what it looks like with just one thread. Okay, 1.05 seconds. Let's try it with three threads and 0. .0 well, part of that was compiling, needed to recompile for some reason. So let's, let's do a fairer comparison. And let's make it bigger now just for grins to see this the speed difference here's with one thread and that might have been too much bigger that's a hundred times bigger than it was before i would have thought that would be a couple seconds not so happy all right let's not so that's too big Go to 5,000 by 5,000. That should be doable. Get ourselves a factor of four back. And there you go. And, oh, I see, but we didn't time it. So let's time that. And that is going to be, it looks like about 10 seconds. Eh, six, six and a half seconds. This is very unscientific, but we're going to have fun. So let's give ourselves seven threads, eight threads, just for grins. Hey, look at that. Um, we got a factor of four speed up, more or less. Three speed up with eight threads. Yeah, so three speed ups, more or less. So the user time used was 6.5 seconds. The real was 2.3. It turns out that... With only four cores on this machine, probably the best I can do is four, and it won't give me quite a linear speed up because memory traffic and other things just don't scale like that. But yeah, it really does go faster with eight, I guess. Well, what happens if I give it 16? Oh, right, there's another thing here, which is that the amount of work per thread isn't the same, and so, Cross people sit there and arrange to start a new thread when the old one finishes on a band. And so the more we break it up, the more that we get a chance to equalize the work. And so it might actually be really faster yet. Um, yeah, you're getting sort of an asymptotic speed up here. But you'll notice that the speed up is around four, which is sort of roughly how many processors cores I have. So apparently hyper threads aren't helping me much here. Let's render this at a more reasonable people size. There we go, 10th of a second. And let's look at this. That folks is a Mandelbrot set. Isn't that beautiful? Um, yes, it's monochrome. Uh, the PN, back when this was written, the pin crate actually didn't support color. It does now. Uh, so we could go back and do some coloring, but I actually like the monochrome version. I think the black and white gray contact, the grayscale contrasts are really, really pretty and interesting. So the black places are places where the function didn't escape. The white places are places where it escaped quickly and the grays are places where it escaped but it took a while and what you can see with a fractal is that it has self-similar structure the um the the if you look at this it looks a lot like this but smaller and if you look at this it looks a lot like this but smaller and this obviously is going to look like like this thing that's up at the upper left hand corner but smaller so that's pretty cool and that's a great example so this rust so this rust thing is sort of kind of cool right again this isn't a huge ton of code and yet not only did we get just sort of scary performance, I promise you if you do that same thing in pure Python, it'll take longer than you're willing to wait to generate a thousand by thousand image. Rust is very fast and yet it's very safe. We didn't have any sort of, well, it just dumps core kind of stuff because Rust prevents that. And yet we were able to parallelize it like a boss and get speed ups essentially equal to the number of cores I had, uh, which is, 
pretty fantastic speed ups without doing very much. If you look at it, you know, there's that little tiny, tiny bit of fiddling around with cross speed, and that is it to get all that parallelism. It's pretty amazing. So that's what I had to tell you today. I hope that it was useful. Uh, see the comments for repo URLs and stuff. And thanks for listening.